would you like to take this to? <laughs> I tell you, we get sometimes get so many papers stuck around in corners, you're not sure what you're going to pick up and read. But you know, it's really a blessing. I don't know about you folks, but I have enjoyed teaching the kings. I hadn't really planned on it, uh, but uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, Brother Knapp when he starts his series on David through the book of Psalms. I know it'll be a real blessing. But it's been no, quite a while since I'd started uh, teaching as far as the kings are concerned. And I've kind of got into the place to where I'm just sort of touching them. So if you, you got your Bible, I didn't prepare any lessons or anything on it. If you needed a Bible, there's some in the back. Our ushers will be glad to get you one for you to just follow right along. Anyone need a copy of the Scriptures? Uh, okay, thank you. All right, Second Chronicles, chapter 19. We will just, we've been looking at the good kings of both Judah, that's the tribe of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah, basically in and around Jerusalem, which is a center of a lot of controversy today. And then we have looked at the, what they term Israel, which is the ten tribes of the northern kingdoms. That basically its headquarters was in and around the area of Samaria. And we began to look at these kings. We started out on the back of the uh, the study, we looked at Josiah, the last good king that showed up in the Bible records of the kings of Judah. And he was a real blessing, but he was the last and from every king, both in Israel and both in Judah after that, until they were carried away into captivity, uh, were not considered to be basically approved of God or at least commented on by God. Then we started looking at Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat is, was a busy king. He was king of Judah. And there were three kings in Israel that served a same time period uh, that, uh, that Jehoshaphat was king. And one of those who was Ahab, as we studied last week, Ahab, the king of Judah, had led uh, the king of uh, uh, I'll get it right in a minute. The king of Israel had led them away from the worship of God. Ahab was a worshiper of Baal, and Jezebel, we all know about, was his queen. But there were other kings beside. But Jehoshaphat, he made a, 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 a mistake. You know, it's wonderful to serve God, and you can always serve God and, and hope that you don't make mistakes. But my grandfather had an expression that I've always remembered. He said, the man that doesn't make any mistakes, they've already patted him in the face with a shovel. You know, in other words, if you live, you're probably going to make some mistakes from time to time. And even when you have the greatest intentions, you uh, sometimes will make the mistake. But anyway, what we found last week in our study of Jehoshaphat, that he made a bad decision. He was a man that we were told he was pleasing to God because he began to take away the idol worship and the high places of Israel that were devoted to the worship of the gods of the land that had been cast out when they came into it. And so as a result, God was pleased with him. But somewhere along the line, he listened to the voice of Ahab, king of Israel, and he invited him to come and join him in a war. He would ask him to come and join him in going to a, a place that was causing both Israel's northern kingdom and the southern kingdom some problems. And so we find that Jehoshaphat did go with him to that war. And we find that he, the, he, was, un, he was concerned about it. I don't know why he decided to go, but he did not consult before he went. But it sometimes reminds me of some of our presidents. They just they go somewhere, but they don't consult with the Lord what they ought to be doing or what, what the nation has the needs of. But anyway, we find that in this war, Ahab lost his life. And the king of Israel 
was uh, killed and was slain, but he had defeated the Syrian army of Ben-Hadad. Now, Ben-Hadad was also an enemy of the southern kingdom as well, and Syria was of any of both. So in 19, chapter 19, let's begin to read. It says, And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hagni, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is a wrath upon thee from before the Lord. He said, Jehoshaphat, you shouldn't have gone to align yourself with Ahab, king of Israel. Even though you would be benefited by the fact that the Syrians would be defeated, you should not have gone. You, should, you, should, you were looking again, as so often, trusting the power of might or the human resources. But he says in verse 3, Nevertheless, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves of the land and hast prepared thine heart to seek God. So he said, you shouldn't have done this, but God's remembering your good things, how that you begin to purge the land. So we find in verse 4, And Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, and he went out again to the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim, and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. In other words, he did the same thing. He went out through the land of Judah, and, the Ephra and uh, ben Benjamin, and even the children of Ephraim he had brought in, and many of the followers of the Jews that were in the nation of Israel, the northern kingdom, were making their way down to the Turdom kingdom because that's, they're still believed in God. And the northern kingdom under Ahab and the following kings there had just departed from God. So Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem, went out again to the people. In other words, he was concerned of God. He's just going to continue what he had started before, before he took his laps of the service of God. And he said he went out from Beersheba to the Mount Ephraim. That's from the southernmost tip of, uh, of the tribe of Benjamin up to Ephraim, which went right up to the borderline with the northern kingdom and uh, up, up between the Jordan and from the sea. And he said he set judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. In other words, he put in men that would be responsible to try to lead and judge the nation according to the Word of God. Boy, if there's anything our America needs now, it's that, isn't it? Some godly people that will have the interest of God in regards to the, uh, God's love of a nation. And he said to the judges, Take heed what you do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord who is with you in the judgment. He said, You're not judging for men. He said, you're judging for the Lord. You want to judge rightly. You want these people to be uh, clean in the eyes of the Lord. We want the judgment that they receive would be the judgments of God, which are correct and proper. He said, the judge. Then he said, verse 7, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. In other words, what he says, the fear of the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord in the Old Testament? The reverence of God. In this case, it was not only the reverence of God, but there was rightly a fear because these judges were given authority. These judges were said, listen, you're the judges in the land, judges in the city, judges in the, in the different tribes, but they had the judge of God, so they did have authority. Now let therefore the fear of the Lord be upon you, and take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons not taking gifts. Boy, you know, he put them on the spot, did he? He said, you're going to be a judge. You're being appointed a judge, but you're not judging for self. Boy, if we could just get that to happen again in our nation, wouldn't that be something? Judge for God and judge not for self. You know, it was every, seems like the, everybody's out for what they personally can re receive. He said, moreover, moreover in Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat set the Levites of the priests the chief fathers of Israel, for the judgment of the Lord and for the controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. He restored again, basically, the central government of Jerusalem. And he set the Levites. That means he put the Levites who were responsible for the house of God, who were responsible to be uh, a priest. In other words, were to present God to the people 
And the prophet presented the people before God. And so he said he charged them. And he charged them saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. In other words, he said, this you're going to do. With perfect, with a faithful heart. In other words, the responsibility of each one of these that he had charged is to judge uh, Judah and Ephraim and Benjamin, to judge them by the word of God. Judge them by the principles of God's word. That's what the command was. And verse 10 says, And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in their cities between blood and blood. In other words, he said if there's a, a, a murder or a killing or something of that nature. He said, Blood and blood between law, commandment, statutes, and judgment. Ye shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord. So even in their relationships with one another, even in the, the relationship with the laws of the Lamb, he said, I want you to be understand that you do not trespass against the supreme authority of any nation, and that's God. Boy, we need to, we could just get back to recognize. We, we respect our government, respect our officers, respect those that we elect to office, but remember there's a higher power, and that respect is due him as well. And that's all he's saying to the people of Israel. He said, and to your brethren, this you do, and you shall not trespass. 11. And verse, and behold, Amariah, the chief priest, is over you in all matters of the Lord. Well, he put a man over it, all matters of the Lord. In other words, if a problem came up in regards to the relationship with God or some of the laws of God, he put a man over the relationship with the laws of God. Then he put Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters. In other words, what do we have in our country? Supposedly, said we have, separation of church and state. That's what is basically we are supposed to have, but you don't see it anymore, do you? In other words, we have intermingled with ever so much stuff. But he said, here it is. He said, the one, the chief priest, he's over matters of the Lord. And Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah, for all the king's matters. Also the Levites shall be officers before you. Deal courageously, and the Lord shall be with you for good. or they good? So what are you really setting up, uh, uh, setting up Jerusalem again? He's trying to make it a godly nation under law and of course we know the law there is the law of God but there are matters that come outside the law of God like you know different things that relations would come to family problems and such as that but let's go on to verse 20 or chapter 20 I'm sorry and it came to pass after this that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon with them at the other side of the Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat into battle you know that's nothing new, what we're having today. These are the, you'll find that here, Jehoshaphat is having the same enemies that we have a, around Jerusalem today. The Moabites, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Ammonites, those down on the, on the, on the Negev Desert, the, the, the Philistine armies which are surrounded, that, that would be in, uh, uh, in Gaza, would be uh, Hamas, and up in north would be, uh, uh, what's the other group up there? I forgot the name of the group. Uh, it's another terrorist group, Hezbollah. And so they're the same ones that's surrounding. Uh, Syria is not friends to Israel anymore at all. It's an old enemy. And then you go on down to Judah or Jordan, that's Moabites and the Amorites and the deserts in the south. Egypt is not a friend, though they seem to be a peacemaker after a sorts. But uh, Brother Risk is really covering all this for us well on Sunday night, and I'll, I'll not try to get into it. But, you know, Israel still has the same enemies that she's always had. They are these basically what we're fighting. And it said, There came some to Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea. Now that, remember, we had already had the attack from Ethiopia, bringing all the tribes of Libya that, that had been defeated under, uh, uh, he had already been defeated. But here we find that a man of God or a nation that's going to live for God is going to find it has enemies. 
there came some and told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, this side of Syria. Well, now what's he talking about? The Dead Sea. That's where Moab, and that's where the Amorites are, and the Amalekites. They're all in that particular. And, you know, they've always been enemies. of the, It was uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites that when, when, when Jerusalem fell to the Roman army, they're the ones that stood in the gap and slew Jews on the, on the authority of the Roman Empire when the Jerusalem fell. This is the whole thing. And he said, on the side of Syria, Hazemat, which is in Gadi. That's down on the coast, just below where, uh, the, where the Hamas is right now. And it said, verse 3, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. In other words, here he is. He's a godly king. He said, we can't contend with this, so we, what are we going to do? We're going to call a fast. We're going to go back and talk to God about this. He gave us the victory before. So we, let's go back. And Judah gathered themselves to ask the help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before a new court. In other words, he had reestablished temple worship. He had uh, replaced the temples of God. He'd done everything there in the new court. So he'd built a new court where he could come together before God and the people could come together for God. And he said, verse 6, And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Art not thou our God? Who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before the people of Israel? That was when Moses and Joshua came in and gave the seed of Abraham to thy friend forever. And they dwell therein and have built thee a sanctuary there in a name. And when evil cometh on us in a sword and judgment and pestilence and famine, we stand before this house. That's what the command was made when they built the temple, when Solomon built the temple. He said, when you need to hear from God, come to this place. And he was going right back to the command that he had had when Solomon had established the temple. He said, we stand before this house, for, the name is, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now, behold, the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not Israel invade. In other words, when they came out of Egypt, God spared that particular tribe. They were peaceful and let the Jews pass through, and God did not allow them to be uh, uh, fallen upon by the might of, of, of Israel. He said, would not let us invade. And it's almost kind of throwing back, said, God, you should let us got rid of them when we had the chance. But he said, God, you didn't let, them, let us invade them. So when they came out of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession. He said, we spared them, and now what do they want to do? They want to take us. They want to conquer us. Well, that's exactly what's going on. Israel is despised and hated today. They're wanting to take it out. Iran, Iraq, all those groups that are there, they're opposed to Israel. He said, they want to cast us out. Verse 12, and, O God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company. They had might between Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim. We studied last uh, week about how many hundred thousands they had. But against the army that came to them, they were outnumbered probably 25 or 30 to 1. It, it would be that the army was outnumbered. Great I army mean, come against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes upon thee. And all Judah stood before the Lord with their little ones, their wives, and their children. In other words, they all as a nation came before God. Then upon Jehezreel, the son of Zechariah, that's the prophet Zechariah, the son of Beniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Matthiah, a Levite, and the sons of Asap, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. In other words, they were petitioning God. And God answered. He came into the house. Well, he said, if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, he said, I'll, 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 I'll answer you. In verse 15, and he said, hearken ye, all Judah, 
and inhabit Jerusalem. And thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, be not dismayed, by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. <laughs> Boy, you know, he said, the battle is not yours. You're the ones that's worrying about fighting this battle. But he said, I want you to know something else. This battle is the Lord. They have attacked him. They've attacked his chosen. They've attacked his people. So here's what he says. Tomorrow go ye down against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Zis, and ye shall find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness is your real. Now, how would you like to have some uh, uh, information like that? We are, quote, unquote, I think, supposedly uh, examining our enemy. We are getting information and uh, what do you call it? Uh, information about where they're at and what we're going to do to that particular crowd and everything like that. How would you like to have God doing your rec reconnaissance for you? Well, that's exactly what happened here. God told him, he said, they're camped right now by the cliff of Zis. He said, now that's right down before the resident of Jericho. But he said this more. He said to them, you shall not need to fight in this battle. Listen, they were just happy to have God on their side. They were willing enough to fight. But he said, you don't have to fight. This seemed to be that which was against God or against God's people, and God decided to intercede. And you know, that, that, that's not impossible yet today. You don't need to fight in this battle. Set yourself, stand ye still. In other words, he said, you get ready to go. You set yourself. You head toward the cliff of Zis. You head, head down there where they're at, but you don't need to fight. But he said, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them. In other words, he, he didn't tell him what he's going to do, but he said the battle is the Lord. But he said, you go fight against them. In other words, there had to be a determination to obey God. And he said, you go fight against them. And the Lord will be with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the grounds. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohites, that was the bearers of the ark, and the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness to Koa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah, ye inhabit Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that would praise the beauty of holiness. And they went out before the army and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. In other words, that's when the choir gets to lead the battle. That's what happened. They went singing. Why did that choir go out front? Well, Jehoshaphat and those leaders believed what God was going to do. He said, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. And when they begin to sing and to praise the Lord, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to destroy and destroy them. And when they had been of the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. And when Judah came towards the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked unto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. And God says that you read the rest of this. It's simply, they took hold to the valley of place in this great brim. They came to the valley of Bechlah. And they returned, verse 27, every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy, for the Lord had made them to rejoice. And the fear of the Lord was upon the kingdoms because the kingdoms all around including Israel and the others, the Moabites, all that, they had a fear of God. And as a result, their fear of the Lord was that they no longer attacked under the reign of this man. Skip on down, verse uh, 35, and I'll, I'll wipe out right here. Just finish what Chronicles gives for us. Verse 35. And after this did Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, 
join himself with Hosiah, king of Israel, who did wickedly. Now, he did this once before, did he not? Now he's doing it again. Does that not show us the frailty of the human heart? Even though God has spared him and given him the victory, and after this did Jehoshaphat, he joined himself with Hezekiah, king of Israel. In other words, Israel was an idol-worshipping nation. It was of the descendants of, the, of those ten tribes of the Jews, but they, they were wicked. He joined himself to make ships to go to Tarshish. Now, there wasn't a war involved. He got involved in a uh, monetary or a uh, commercial enterprise but you don't you don't go to do you don't go to the enemy for battle but you don't go to them and do business with them either and this is exactly what it is and he joined himself to him to make ships to go to Tarshish and they made ships in Elon as they gave her that is clear down where the Gulf of Aqaba is out of the Red Sea and said, Then Ebenezer, the son of Dovah and of Maresha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because thou hast joined thyself with Azaziah, the Lord hath broken thy works, and thy ships are broken, and they were not able to go to Tarshish. In other words, he ended up on a low note, and yet he was a king that accomplished great things for God because he believed in the hand of the Lord. But you know, that's, isn't, that, isn't that where we get into trouble? When we quit believing what God's Word says to us and obeying the Word of God, which we know is God's Word to us and is truth, and start thinking that we know more about God, how to run our life and how to run our nation, how to run our cities, how to run everything that we are, when we start doing that, this is exactly what happened. That's what he did. He said, God's been good to us. We're prosperous. We, we were strong. So we made this ship, and we'll get in with this high king of Israel, and, <clears throat> and we'll go down. He said, but what happened? The Lord hath broken thy works, and the ships are broken, and they were not able to go to Tarshish. What's in Tarshish? Somebody said in Tarshish where King Solomon's mines were, <laughs> where the gold that came in to Israel, where the wealth of Solomon came from. I don't know for sure, but that's what he says. Now Jehoshaphat slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, and Jehoram, his son, reigned in his stead. All right, we're going to quit with Jehoram. We may never see Jehoram. I never really talk about Jehoram because we got Brother uh, Knapp, He's going to talk, take us. He's going to walk us with David through the Psalms, and I think that is a beautiful study. And I think you'll get you'll get more blessing out of it than you did out of me chasing these kings around the countryside. All right, let's stand. We'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. We thank you, Father, for the Word of God. We ask only now that as we go, that we'll draw from this study, this brief study, oh so brief, of our our kings. We'll realize one thing, if we love the Lord, and if we honor the Lord, if we seek the will of the Lord, God is going to be on our side. Even though we're weak and imperfect, we make our mistakes, we walk in the will of God, and He'll watch over us and supply the needs we have. Same thing with our church. If we keep the Lord the head of our church, our church will prosper. And so now, Father, we commit all this to your blessed name. In his name I pray. Amen.